Hello. Thank you again for everybody to attend this uh, session. So uh, yesterday uh, we presented or we covered the following topics uh, concerning the, the structural restoration of a historic building in Beirut. Uh, in fact, we covered the main components of a Beiruti house structural system, uh, going from the foundation to the columns to the walls, etc. And also we presented the in-plane damages and how to treat or to repair this kind of damage. Uh, today we will go through uh, the out-of-plane uh, failure mechanisms and also uh, the damages affected that affected the horizontal elements like beams and slabs. To start uh, with the out-of-plane failure mechanism, it is worth mentioning that uh, to have a lateral resistance of a building, uh, we have to know a bit about the box behavior which consists in connecting the vertical elements like walls, for example, uh, in a unified response due to the presence, for example, of a rigid uh, diaphragm, horizontal diaphragm. We are talking about uh, slabs. Unfortunately, uh, this rigid diaphragm and this box behavior is absent in the Beiruti houses. For, th for this reason, we can explain the level of damage that, uh, that affected the Beiruti houses and its uh, structural uh, system. Well, I will start by the out-of-plane failure mechanisms. Uh, we noticed three types of this uh, uh, damage. damage. First, uh, we have a partial collapse of the peripheral walls. I'm talking about the photo to the left and uh, the, the photo number A. The second one is a failure in terms of lateral or let's say peripheral walls and interior walls. And the third type is the end wall overturning. I'm talking about photo number C. So what to do? We have to rebuild. We don't have any other choice. So uh, there is a procedure how to build. First of all, the uh, construction or the re reconstruction phase should be pre preceded by uh, some instructions, like for example, to install a complete uh, propping system all over uh, the building uh, to avoid uh, additional partial or global, uh, let's say, collapse. Also, we have to uh, stiffen our openings. We call that strangling, and the photo to the upper right shows a sample of how to uh, stiffen or to put stiffeners, uh, in-plane stiffeners, uh, inside our openings. Uh, as general guidelines, uh, the natural hydraulic lime should be used for the reconstruction of masonry. And we are talking here about the NHL5 used for structural uh, repair and restoration. Uh, other issues should be respected, like for example, when building or when reconstructing or when, when assembling the blocks, the mortar should fill uh, the bad joint together with the head joint to ensure uh, a continuity in the mechanical behavior of uh, walls. Uh, also, corners should be interlocked. And here it is a key point because, uh, as we will see uh, in the next slide, the corner detachments uh, were uh, observed and were uh, noticed like uh, everywhere in, in uh, Beiruti houses. Uh, at the end, this process of reconstruction should be followed by a structural uh, plastering by adding, let's say, the mesh that we saw yesterday when treating the in-plane uh, uh, damages. I will present two applications recently done. The first one concerned the reconstruction of a corner that was collapsed uh, after the blast. Uh, in fact, the, 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 the process of reconstruction should start by sorting the element. Here we are talking about the stone blocks. Uh, we have to number these blocks, to clean them, to, to label them in order to reuse them. Uh, also, the second, uh, the central photo, uh, the lower second photo shows how we are uh, filling the bad joints and the head joints with uh, lime mortar and uh, also to interlock the corners 
we can add or to enhance the resistance of the corner uh, against uh, lateral de uh, detachment, we can add some reinforcement. Like here, for example, we're presenting uh, some reinforcement added to the corner and fixed together vertically by adding a vertical threaded rod. This uh, rod. This will ensure a continuity and a good resistance of a corner. The second application is related to a reconstruction of a double archway. So as we see here, uh, the, the stone blocks of the arches are labeled and numbered. After that, uh, we have to install our uh, mold in order to reconstruct correctly in a uh, uh, good geometry uh, compatible to the initial, uh, let's say, configuration. Uh, then we rebuild our masonry step by step and stone uh, by stone. Well, I will move now to what we call, for example, the hybrid, the hybrid damage. It is a combination of in-plane and out-of-plane. In-plane, it means the crack, the crack uh, pattern exists inside uh, the, the wall of the, the plane of the wall, and the out-of-plane, it means that the deformation is perpendicular to the uh, uh, plane of the wall. So here we uh, noticed four patterns for this kind of damages. The first one is uh, uh, in-plane axe cracks and out-of-plane deformation. Uh, in fact, this was uh, noticed or identified intermediate walls because in this uh, kind of walls, it's like a, a slab supported on its four edges. So the failure line will follow either an X shape or a tra trapezoidal shape. Uh, in fact, we don't have a magic formula to, to decide when we have to dismantle our wall and to rebuild it again or to uh, restore it uh, or repair it. Uh, let's say, uh, practically speaking, we can consider, let's say, uh, uh, a, a guideline, a small guideline, uh, like, for example, to consider the deflection of the wall, the lateral deflection of the wall, uh, respect, uh, in fact, or compared to its height. For example, if you consider a wall height divided by 250, if we talk, for example, about a, a, a wall having, for example, five meters of height, so a, uh, an, an allowable de deformation or deflection, lateral deflection, uh, we are talking here about two, three centimeters, not more. So if this uh, ratio is uh, not respected, in this case, we should uh, dismantle the wall and rebuild it again. But here, again, we have to uh, prop our system, our, our uh, floors, uh, to avoid uh, local or uh, global collapse. Some photos also illustrating this uh, pattern. Uh, as, as I stated before, this type of, of damages is related exist in uh, the intermediate uh, floors, not in the last floor. So here we move to another type, another pattern of, of damage, the trapezoidal shape of failure lines. And this uh, pattern exists mainly in the last floor, where, in fact, the top end of the wall is connected uh, to a loose uh, fault ceiling. We call uh, this Baghdadi. Uh, it's very beautiful. However, structurally speaking, it is very weak. Uh, it cannot ensure a good connection between the wall and itself. So uh, here again, uh, structurally speaking, we have a wall supported on its lower uh, uh, level and on, uh, on its uh, vertical edges and free from uh, the top. So uh, the failure lines uh, will follow a tra trapezoidal shape. Uh, the photo uh, to the right uh, is related to, to uh, uh, an iconic building in Beirut, the Sursa Palace or the Cochrane Palace. And we can notice a deformation due to the blast of 22 centimeters. Uh, if compared to a wall height of 6 or 6.5 meters, it's a huge uh, uh, deformation. So, so in this case, we don't have any other choice than to uh, dismantle and to rebuild again. However, uh, uh, this, uh, let's say, uh, process is, very, is a bit dangerous and critical. So 
sometimes we need to add uh, lateral bracings, like for example, tie rods, or let's say uh, uh, wood timber uh, braces, uh, to, to in, in order to, to uh, not to have a, a, uh, an overturning of the wall or a collapse of the wall. I will move to a third pattern. A third pattern is about the inward deformation. We call this bulging. It is identified between two adjacent openings of an intermediate wall. Uh, let's say this is also a critical case, and uh, we do not have any other choice than dismantling and rebuilding again. But uh, I, I keep repeating that these uh, uh, tasks should be done. Uh, in fact, let's say we have to prop before and after that to go through a dismantling process. Uh, here I'm showing, uh, let's say, a system of vertical propping. We can uh, note that the props are installed beneath the uh, main beams. Yesterday, so that they can be made of, uh, let's say, wood or, or steel beams. However, if this bulging exists uh, in intermediate uh, floor, not in the ground floor, uh, we should prop vertically even in the ground floor level. And the wall should be laterally braces by putting an inclined system of, of propping. Well, I will move now to a fourth pattern, which is the uh, corners detachment. This one is uh, identified in the last floor because of the weak uh, connection between perpendicular walls and also because of the weak connection with the Baghdadi uh, ceiling uh, at the top floor of uh, top level of the of the wall. So uh, uh, what to do? Also, we don't have other choice uh, than to but to rebuild, dismantle first and to rebuild. Here I'm showing uh, other photos about uh, this pattern. It is uh, it was really abundant. Uh, in fact, we are talking in in some cases about let's say. 12 to 15 centimeters of uh, uh, wall opening, which is uh, really dangerous and uh, vulnerable uh, to collapse. Here, I will move also to, the, to this four, uh, fourth pattern. And if, for example, we don't have the possibility to uh, dismantle and to rebuild, uh, at least we have to secure our building by installing a confinement, uh, confining system for the wall, I'm talking here about confining belts or, for example, uh, uh, about uh, tie rods. Uh, the, the upper photo um, shows very well the push-pull uh, system. Uh, it consists in, in installing tie rods for, for tension and uh, 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 lateral props for uh, compression. I will move to uh, a common uh, uh, failure mechanism which is the collapse of the central archway, or what we call here the triple arch. In fact, uh, this uh, arch is made up of, let's say, uh, two columns, two cylinder columns, and uh, these columns support uh, pointed arches. Uh, this system is really uh, very weak against uh, lateral uh, loading. And uh, we add to this the rigid frame uh, uh, surrounding uh, the system. So because it is a bit very weak and slender, uh, it automatically uh, collapsed due to the to the blast. So uh, what to do in this case? Here, for example, I'm showing a uh, recent project uh, that uh, we did. In fact, the first step is to prop in the area around uh, uh, the triple arch. So uh, in order to avoid uh, additional collapse or instability uh, of the system, uh, this, uh, this uh, step should be followed by the column, uh, column reassembling. So uh, here I, I will show some photos step by step. But for example, we noticed that in, in many cases, uh, the columns uh, were broken into several pieces. For example, if uh, the column is for, broken in two or three pieces, not more, there is a possibility to do this reassembling uh, process. 
Uh, also, uh, we can reassemble or not, depending on the uh, failure angle of, of uh, the column. Uh, so uh, if we have more than two or three pieces, we should replace our column. Uh, columns are made out of uh, marble or local stone in, in Beiruti house. Uh, how to do it, uh, we will see in the next slide. Uh, after this, uh, after position, repositioning the columns, we should install our uh, molds in order to rebuild our pointed uh, arches. Well, here uh, I'm showing a step-by-step -step, uh, reconstruction of this triple arch. Uh, the first uh, photo uh, to the left, to the upper left, uh, shows how we are uh, reassembling the column by putting a common tyro to the upper part and lower part uh, glued with an epoxy, an appropriate epoxy uh, binder. And here I invite you to, to check uh, the, the data sheet of each epoxy because we need something compatible with the stone material. Not every epoxy is compatible with marble or with sandstone. So this is a, a really critical step uh, to do. Uh, then we are repositioning uh, our column vertically. Uh, after that, we are putting our molds and uh, the, uh, the triple arch uh, is shown in its final state after restoration. Uh, and I, I mean by the triple arch is really uh, existing everywhere in, in, in Beiruti houses. It, it is typical. So uh, it is like a, a symbol of the uh, uh, Beiruti house. Uh, another uh, damage uh, affected the triple arch, but it is less dangerous. Uh, we are talking here about an excessive tilting of the columns. Uh, these photos are really remarkable. Uh, they show that uh, the, the pointed arches were simply supported to the columns. So any lateral uh, load like the, the blast one uh, can uh, move the, the columns uh, let uh, what to do. In fact, the first step to do is to prop the uh, uh, the, the arches, okay, the pointed arches. Then we have to distress the columns from the base to remove the base of the column manually and to reposition again the columns in order to uh, find the po the uh, initial po uh, position. Well. Uh, I'm moving now to the treatment or the restoration of uh, floors or, or beams. Uh, I will start by the jack arch slab, which is made of uh, a combination of flat arches and steel beams. We have noticed that the corrosion uh, has affected the lower part of the, of the uh, steel beams. It is not due to the blast. However, if you want to do a restoration uh, job, we should also repair uh, these types of elements. Uh, what to do? In fact, we have to uh, remove the lower part of the I-beam if it is really highly corroded. Uh, then we have to replace it by a, a T-shaped uh, section with the same dimensions. So here a question will emerge. Uh, how can we connect uh, both of them? We are not obliged to, co to connect them because in the central area of the beam, we call it a neutral axis. And here we are not very, let's say we are in, in secure, and we are secure uh, uh, for the bending effect. So after we install this uh, new part of, uh, of a T section, uh, we have to uh, inject between the, uh, or to fill the gap between the flat arches and uh, the, the newly uh, installed beam. Uh, we do recommend here a non-shrinkable uh, grout, uh, so to keep a good uh, connection and good stability uh, for, for, the added, uh, for the added beam. I will move now to uh, the treatment of uh, timber and hybrid slab. Uh, we have noticed in many cases that our, uh, uh, let's say, joist system is uh, really broken. In this photo, uh, we can see that uh, 
uh, almost all the, the joints are broken in their middle area. So uh, what to do? If the failure uh, occurred at the middle, uh, mid -span, at mid span of the joints, my recommendations are to replace it because here we have a weak point uh, um, related to bending moment. So uh, I prefer not to, uh, to repair, but to replace in this case. Uh, and we can use the, the, uh, the remaining parts of the joists in, in uh, doing other uh, repairing uh, work. Uh, so, but if we have a failure at support or worn at support, we can uh, uh, keep the, the existing uh, beams and we can add an extension, a new extension, the one in red, we can uh, uh, notice their presence in uh, the two sketches, and we have to connect them correctly to the existing uh, beams by, uh, let's say, screws or confining belts, but we have to respect the shape of the, the, this uh, Z shape, so to ensure the maximum uh, uh, length of connection between the uh, two beams. Also, we can conceive a metallic system, a stainless steel metallic system, but all these interventions are not like a discrete they will appear at the end of the uh, uh, intervention. Now, otherwise, we have uh, to, to, to replace, to keep the, the same initial configuration. So uh, the second proposal consists in adding a U uh, shape, uh, um, let's say a stainless steel plate connected to the existing and the newly added beam by horizontal uh, connectors. There is a lot of uh, proposals in this issue, but we are uh, presenting uh, the simplest uh, ones. Uh, so anyone can, can have other details for this kind of, of repair or restoration. Another common, uh, uh, let's say, damage for, uh, uh, for, for the floor elements is the, the, an excessive deflection of uh, timber floors. When I'm talking about an excessive de deflection, it is also, uh, let's say, a problem of, uh, of vibration. So when we walk uh, on these floors, we can feel the vibration. And this is not very uh, good to feel, to be felt, OK? So we have to, to, uh, to repair somehow. Uh, if you, we don't want to dismantle all the floor and to uh, reconstruct it again, or to put some uh, vertical uh, opposite pressure in order to, to push uh, uh, up the, the floor, we can add uh, steel beams. However, the gaps between the newly added steel beam and the joists should be filled in order to ensure a continuity uh, in the uh, load transmission. So uh, we have to add some shims, uh, metallic shims, uh, which consist of, uh, let's say, uh, rectangular uh, flat strips metal strips or stainless steel strips. Uh, and these types of, of uh, shims are customized because not everywhere we have the same uh, height to, to, to fill between the uh, timber joist and the uh, metallic, metallic uh, let's say, uh, beam. I will move now to the structural upgrade and I will close my presentation by this chapter. Well, uh, everybody asked how to uh, reinforce or to upgrade or to make uh, a better resistant, resistance for our uh, building against lateral load. Lateral loads, I repeat that uh, it can be uh, a, an earthquake, uh, let's say load or blast load or a uh, wind load. Uh, for, for beauty houses, uh, the wind load is insignificant uh, because they do have, let's say, a maximum uh, three floors. And if we are talking about five meters, uh, the maximum height uh, doesn't exceed uh, 15 to 20 meters. In some uh, iconic buildings, yes, we have uh, uh, more than that. Uh, we talk about 22, 25 meters, but not more. So the wind effect is really neglected if we if compared compared to uh, let's say uh, an earthquake uh, load or a blast load 
So, uh, what to do? Three steps or three interventions. First, we have to increase the strengths of our vertical system. When we talk about vertical system, and as we saw yesterday, that the main element, structural, uh, vertical structural element, uh, uh, is uh, the wall system. The wall system. So we have to increase the capacity of our walls. We are talking about in-plane stiffness and out-of-plane stiffness. Second, we should care about the improvement of the connections uh, stiffness also. Connections may represent a, a connection between two walls, let's say a corner or two uh, perpendicular walls, and uh, we can talk about connection uh, between walls and floors. So here there is a, a lot of work to do. Uh, and at the end, to ensure a box behavior, because uh, 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 we, we said that uh, a box behavior in, in, is ensured through a rigid diaphragm. So the rigid diaphragm is we are talking about uh, a slab. Uh, if, for example, in a concrete building, the concrete slab is really a rigid diaphragm. Uh, it can link uh, correctly uh, the, the vertical uh, system, the vertical structural system, like, for example, columns and walls. However, in uh, Beiruti houses or in historic buildings uh, similar to Beiruti houses, uh, we saw that uh, floors are um, timber floors or, let's say, hybrid floors, not so stiff. Uh, unlike, for example, the Jack Arch slab uh, that was not really affected by the blast effect, but uh, the, the uh, matter uh, of, of aging, like corrosion, for example and the environment uh, uh, of Beirut. So uh, here, if the building, if the system, uh, the flooring system is, is uh, made of timber or, or, or mixed structure, we have to increase the in-plane stiffness of this uh, system. So first to start with the enhancement of our uh, um, resistance or, or in-plane uh, stiffness of our walls. Uh, we saw yesterday that we can add a meshing system. However, this meshing system should be placed on the inner and the outer side of the wall uh, because uh, an earthquake will act into a horizontal direction in the positive direction and the negative direction. So uh, both faces should resist to, end to a tensile uh, effect. Uh, it is also uh, uh, good to know that uh, these uh, mesh, uh, in fact, the, the, the installation of mesh uh, should be also, uh, let's say, uh, connectors, horizontal connectors should be added to, to this system in order to connect uh, both sides of, uh, of, uh, uh, of, of mesh system. Um, unfortunately, in Lebanon, nowadays, there is a shortage, uh, shortage in, uh, uh, in providing this type of, of uh, material. However, as I mentioned yesterday, that we can uh, put um, multi-layer or a double layer of mesh if, for example, the, the tensile strength of, of the existing mesh in the market uh, is not sufficient. So uh, we can find a solution. For example, here, as you can see, uh, we put two, two layers, but uh, the, the first one in, the, in, in white, it is Reinforce, uh, to, to reinforce the, the plaster. So uh, the mesh can be made of, uh, let's say, uh, carbon fiber reinforced polymer or aramid or basalt or glass. So uh, it depends on the availability of this product in the local market. Second, I will move to the enhancement of or the strengthening of our wall-to-wall -wall connection. Uh, here it is also a recent project uh, in Beirut that was uh, strengthened a bit. Uh, for example, here at the le uh, at the, the photo to the left shows uh, a, a stitching, a horizontal stitching between the peripheral wall and the inner wall. Uh, in the 
uh, somatic view, it can be clearly uh, seen how the uh, stitching uh, is, is executed. So uh, at least the stitching should cross the joint between the two consecutive, uh, let's say, uh, blocks and uh, having a good depth, not less than, for example, 30 to 40 uh, centimeter, uh, centimeters inside the stone blocks. And here again, we should choose a compatible binder between the, uh, let's say, the stainless steel uh, thigh rods and the sandstone. So uh, every time we will choose a, 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 an epoxy or a certain binder, we should be very, uh, we should be sure that uh, uh, there is a compatibility in terms of chemical interaction or let's say humidity or temperature, etc. cetera. Uh, the photo to the right also shows a, a stitching of uh, a stitching uh, process or application uh, of a uh, uh, corner or an angle of, uh, of the building. So, uh, like we have done for the uh, in-plane stitching of, of a wall when we had uh, a, uh, an in-plane uh, crack damage, here again we have to strip the plaster and uh, let's say here uh, we, we can notice that the, the stripping is, is uh, done uh, in a zigzag pattern uh, to avoid, uh, let's say, shrinkage. This is very important uh, to, to do. This is the right way to do it. Uh, so in this way, when we apply stitching, uh, we will have a, a tensile lateral uh, resistance and enhancement in, in terms of a tensile uh, resistance, resistance of the corner. Uh, not to forget that uh, stitches should always be connected to the mesh in order to uh, ensure a, a monolithic behavior of uh, the connection. We can also uh, add uh, a tie system or uh, a confining belt to, to our buildings. Uh, to the right, we have two photos showing uh, historic uh, tie rods with anchoring uh, plates and uh, here we can notice that the plates were made uh, up of normal steel and they were rectangular. Uh, we can find other uh, uh, geometry for this plate like for example to the left the cross plate uh, or the cross uh, shape uh, the x-shape anchor plate uh, which are also done here in a uh, project in Lebanon uh, they are uh, in stainless steel. Uh, for the tie rods, we can use like uh, rigid circular uh, uh, tie rods, but here uh, we have to, to know that they are not, let's say, threaded because we have uh, some four, five, six meters to, to install. And usually threaded rods are the lengths of the, a threaded, a uh, uh, common threaded rod is about one meter, not more. So here we are talking about uh, steel elements, circular plain steel elements uh, that we need to install. Uh, and uh, the effect of this tie is uh, to confine uh, the, or to connect two parallel uh, walls, uh, especially to their corners and to ensure a confining uh, effect. So when a lateral load will act on this uh, wall, uh, it will be resisted not by the tensile, uh, low tensile flanks of the stone blocks, but also by, by the uh, effect, uh, the presence of the, these tie rods uh, made up of steel or cables. And we know very well that steel or cables uh, acts very well uh, when subjected to, 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 to tension. I will move now to uh, the floor or wall to floor connection. So uh, we notice that uh, in many cases, uh, there is a detachment between the uh, joints or the main beams and uh, the wall system. Because uh, during the construction process, uh, joints and beams were simply supported on the top of a course, let's say, uh, uh, at a height of 4.5 meters from the ground floor or the other floors. So uh, when, when uh, subjected to a lateral force, uh, uh, the, 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 the joints or the beams will, will uh, 
will be separated from, from the vertical elements. So uh, the solution uh, consists in connecting uh, the, the joists to the wall system. We have many proposals uh, from which I uh, chose two. Uh, the one to the left is compatible or is suitable if we, we have access to the wood plank from the upper sides. That means that we have to remove the tiling system and the filling materials and to put our, uh, let's say, plate system and anchor a tie rod system, which is shown here. I don't know if you can see my, my point. So it is installed on the upper level of uh, a joist or a uh, uh, beam, main beam, uh, with connectors uh, that we insert inside the mass of the beam and to the, uh, they are connected to the outer face of a wall by a uh, plate, uh, anchor plate uh, element or a confining belt. Uh, in fact, uh, we do recommend a confining belt also because in addition to this connection with uh, that uh, it will ensure between the beam and the wall, the outer face of the wall, it will also uh, provide a uh, horizontal uh, confining effect like uh, the belt we wear uh, uh, in, uh, on our clothes. So uh, it will ensure, let's say, a good uh, connection between the floors and the wall system. And one uh, an, a lateral effect will occur. So uh, this will allow us to, to have a certain resistance and to upgrade our our, uh, let's say, building against uh, lateral loads. The second uh, application or alternative to the right, uh, it can be installed uh, without uh, removing the tile system or the uh, filling materials above, uh, above the plants, uh, the, the wooden plants. So it consists of installing two uh, flat strips stainless steel uh, uh, flat strips connected to tie rods also from each side of uh, the beam and to connect them again to the other side of the wall. Uh, here we have to say that uh, this intervention will be visible. So uh, it all depends uh, about what we are aiming to see or uh, if it is important to keep the initial uh, configuration of our flooring system uh, statically, I'm talking statically, or not. I will move to the connection between an inner wall and uh, the flooring system. So uh, previously we have connected our peripheral walls here to the joists or the uh, beam system. However, from inside the building, we can install for an intermediate wall or, or a, uh, let's say, a wall connecting two uh, adjacent floors uh, we can uh, use this uh, proposal that we are applying in, in some uh, uh, ongoing projects. It consists of placing a uh, L-shaped, let's say, ring all around the periphery of a room on the floor level, let's say above the wooden planks. Uh, they connect, they are connected uh, from each side of the wall and uh, vertically they, are, they connect the uh, timber beams or the, uh, let's say, uh, uh, joists or uh, two main uh, consecutive beams. So this is a good way to connect beams to uh, intermediate, let's say, uh, walls. However, also we have to, this is conceptual, uh, additional, let's say, assessment and uh, based on calculations should be conducted. So I repeat that the aim of this, uh, these two presentation of yesterday and today's one is uh, to, to uh, make some awareness, awareness how to do it correctly. So we will have these guidelines. Some of them can be uh, applicable without the uh, intervention of a civil engineer restorer or structural engineer restorer. But for example, this one, or uh, let's say uh, other interventions should be uh, confirmed by calculations, by uh, a structural assessment, by non-destructive tests or minor destructive tests. Uh, the traditional way we do for 
uh, each uh, historic building when we are checking its capacity or we are doing a structural assessment. Uh, not to forget also uh, the, the, let's say, the support of these beams. Uh, in many cases, I will go back to a uh, previous slide. In many cases, we noticed uh, here, for example, we noticed that the, the uh, support of uh, the main beams, especially of the main beams, uh, is, is really damaged. In this case, we have to restore it by uh, doing uh, some special injections, either with uh, NHL5 or if the stone is uh, where the, uh, the stone support or the stone uh, block is really damaged, we can use some uh, special grouts having uh, a real compressive strength, a high compressive strength if compared to the natural hydraulic uh, line. So the intervention should take care of the beam itself, okay, the broken beam itself, and also the support. The supports are really uh, crucial in uh, ensuring a good connection between, let's say, uh, uh, floors and, uh, and and walls. I will move now to the, interve the intervention that uh, we should do also on the last floor level. As we have stated before that, uh, and walls, it means the walls belonging to the last floor, uh, are somehow uh, uh, acting like cantilever walls. So they have a free end at their top because the connection with the floor is really very weak. So uh, we have two uh, possibilities. If, for example, uh, for example, the roof truss or the attic is still in a good condition and we do not want to remove it, we can fix the uh, timber steel or the timber or the steel ring. Usually it is made up of t timber. This one, uh, what we call in uh, French sablier. So we can connect this uh, uh, ring beam to the stone blocks uh, through a vertical stitching uh, every 50 to 1 meters, uh, to 1 meter. So uh, vertically, so we perforate. And here uh, also, I do recommend small diameters for stitching but uh, having multiple, uh, so to increase the, the number of stitches and to uh, increase, uh, to decrease their diameter. Uh, we can use the stainless steel feathered rods, we can use other uh, innovative materials like FRP or CFRP or uh, whatever. Also the binder, the epoxy binder between the stitches and the stone blocks should be, uh, let's say, compatible with the nature of the uh, stone material. In addition to that, we have to increase the horizontal uh, stiffness of our uh, uh, last floor. So to the right, I'm showing, let's say, a bracing system which uh, will ensure a, a very good uh, stiffness to, to our last floor. Uh, in addition to that, we can add some floating, what we call floating slabs, which consists of uh, adding uh, a ring beam uh, all over the wall top, uh, the wall top. So we add a uh, newly, uh, he here we can do this if the attic conditions is really in a, a very bad and we need to dismantle it, uh, dismantle it and to reconstruct it again. In this case, we can add uh, systematically uh, a ring beam all over the uh, uh, the the level of the so the top level of the walls and to uh, put on them let's say uh, prefabricated uh, let's say a concrete slab so I'm talking about prefabricated so not uh, we don't have to pour uh, concrete slab so we post them and uh, it is reversible we can easily dismantle them because uh, the connection will be uh, mechanically with uh, the, the steel beams, not with the stone blocks. So this is very important to, to say that uh, I'm not uh, uh, doing a marketing to, to install uh, concrete uh, uh, slabs uh, on the top of uh, our uh, Beiruti house, house uh, system. No, 
uh, if we need to uh, remove the attic, uh, an additional, let's say, uh, uh, enforcement or uh, stiffening can be added through this type of floating uh, slab. Uh, it uh, can be also done with a system of corrugated sheets. So uh, there is multiple choices to go through. Uh, but uh, usually, if uh, the condition of the attic is um, acceptable, we go through this, uh, uh, we adopt this uh, system of uh, bracing with, let's say, uh, tie rods, uh, cross tie rods, and anchoring plates. Finally, uh, to enhance our, uh, let's say, lateral uh, resistance of, or of our uh, building, we mentioned that we have to take care of our uh, walls so to enhance or to increase their uh, in-plane and, and out of plane uh, stiffness uh, then to uh, to uh, let's say uh, improve the conditions of the connection the connections between walls uh, uh, them together and a wall and floors and the third point is to uh, reduce the in-plane floor deformability, which means to increase the stiffness, the in-plane stiffness of our uh, of our floor, in order to have a rigid diaphragm uh, capable to connect uh, the walls, the wall system, the wall system, in a unified response. So to do so, we have uh, ma many many alternatives. I have also uh, chosen two among many. So the first one to the left consists uh, in duplicating the, uh, the, the wooden planks. So uh, it means to, to install a new layer of uh, planks, but this time perpendicularly to uh, the uh, or original direction of the existing uh, plank system. So if, for example, uh, the existing uh, uh, planks are uh, parallel to X, so the newly one will be installed uh, perpendicular to X, it means parallel to Y. Uh, we can uh, easily uh, fix them by, uh, by the two systems, the existing one and the newly installed one by, let's say, screws, by also special uh, chemical uh, binders, but also if uh, let's say the wooden plank system is really in a good condition, we can also add some uh, in-plane braces made up of stainless steel or uh, carbon fiber reinforced plastic or, or whatever. So in brief, these are the new, uh, let's say, key points or uh, milestones in enhancing our uh, structural uh, lateral resistance of our structural system for a Beiruti house. Uh, they are not uh, complicated. Uh, they can be applied easily. But in fact, uh, we have to, to uh, prepare a method statement because uh, I, will, I will give an example. Uh, if we're going to, for example, uh, take off all of our, let's say, uh, plastering uh, uh, system uh, from the walls, uh, in some cases, it may be critical because for slender uh, uh, walls, uh, it is recommended to, to do that by, uh, by parts. So we, we take off, let's say, two meters of, uh, a, of a plaster, uh, of a wall plaster, then we treat, then we go uh, further. So, uh, and this is uh, the job of, of a restorer, uh, an architect restorer, and especially a let's say, a structural engineer restorer. Well, uh, I think uh, we, are, we are done. Hopefully, the, these two presentations were a bit helpful to, to spread a bit the awareness how to, to make uh, uh, correct uh, restorations in terms of uh, structural restoration. Uh, again, I, will, I have to, uh, to say thank you to the Beirut Heritage Initiative. Also, not to forget the efforts of the Directorate General of Antiquities, who is doing uh, a big effort, uh, a big effort, together with private, uh, let's say, NGOs. Also, I need to thank uh, my team uh, who assisted me in preparing and gathering the photos, and also the last credit to uh, the people who provided 
the maximum number of photos and uh, let's say uh, is executed project for these uh, kind of presentation. Thank you, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for your attendance. Thank you, Michel. So we have a first question uh, about the arches. Do you push the arches before dismantling the columns? How do we guarantee there will be low transfer without excessive deformation of the arch? Uh, you mean this one, the triple arch, this one? Yes, yes, it's about the triple yeah. arches. In fact, uh, yes, yes. In fact, uh, when I talk about uh, propping systematically, when we have to dismantle or to remove or to do whatever, uh, what we call a critical operation, we have to prop. So uh, it's not just propping the, the uh, pointed arches. Uh, during this operation, I do also recommend to, to prop all uh, the area the, uh, surrounding the, the, this uh, uh, triple arch, uh, let's say, uh, that we need to, to, to dismantle or to uh, distress uh, its column. So. Once we support all uh, the, the arches and also the, the slab uh, above, uh, we can ensure that if the columns are distressed, I mean by distressed, so usually columns are uh, subjected to compression. But if we release the base of these columns, they will be distressed. So the compression that will uh, affect or will, is uh, on the top of these columns will be automatically transferred to the propping system and uh, the one who's propping uh, the, the arches and the other props propping the, the slabs. So, uh, for, and we have to notice also that the props should start by, for example, the third level, if we are doing this operation, and continue down to the second and ground floor. So, not just we are going to do a, a propping for uh, the, the floor itself or for the area, uh, of the triple arch. We have also to ensure a vertical continuity of these props in order to ensure also the continuity of the vertical load that were uh, affecting the columns. Once we uh, release the base, release the base, it means that we remove uh, manually the base. Uh, we have to do some uh, mechanical operation with some hand uh, tools uh, in order to take off the columns. Uh, once we do that, we can reposition the column in its initial state. And here, I do uh, to put uh, a, a binder between uh, the top of the column and beginning uh, the the point the pointed arches, uh, because as as we can show uh, we can see here, and I have uh, noticed that in many cases, uh, similar to this one that really uh, the beginning of uh, the start of the uh, triple, the uh, pointed arches is really simply supported without any uh, mortar. It is like we, we, ha we have put this uh, uh, without any uh, chemical connection between uh, the columns and uh, the pointed arches. So it is, uh, an, it is not a very difficult uh, uh, operation to do uh, because in fact, we do not allow ourselves to, to put some lateral pressure on the top of the column in order to reposition uh, its uh, initial configuration. Uh, this is uh, very critical because we may uh, uh, lead to, to, to uh, if we're going to push it from the top uh, or from any place, it will be a lateral uh, force uh, acting on a slender element like this one. Uh, I, I uh, let's say, uh, as a reminder, in fact, the column's diameter is about 15 to 17 centimeters, not more. So that's it. Thank you. A second question. About the use of non-shrinkable mortar, does it really achieve load transfer or should we also consider expansive mortar? Uh, in some cases, in some cases, well, I will, okay, a very good question. So let me uh, go again. Uh, no, to the floors. OK. So here, for example. Uh, in fact, where, where we, when we install this type of a new uh, element, like the steel beam, we have two choices. 
once we install the, the steel element, we can prop it from uh, beneath and put some, let's say, uh, pre-compression or uh, on on uh, on the lower level of the beam. So the beam will be really tight with uh, uh, with uh, the upper uh, joints. And once we uh, put this uh, vertical uh, uh, ascended pressure, we can make our injection uh, into supports. So uh, once we will release the props, okay, uh, the, the beam will, will uh, have some, some release and it can compress the, the, uh, the grout, the non-shrinkable grout. So, um, to my, uh, in my opinion, uh, it is sufficient. But if we use also uh, a, a uh, let's say, a grout with expansion, it will be, uh, it will be great. It will be, let's say, uh, very good. Uh, however, we need also to to know that uh, the use of the grout is really critical and uh, it should have some compatibility with the sandstone material. So we will not uh, uh, make uh, this error again and use, for example, uh, concrete to, to fill the gap. Because as you know, concrete and uh, lime are not very well, uh, are not uh, friends or the, the stones. In many cases, uh, I have, uh, let's say, checked uh, in local projects. Um, we all know that uh, a concrete mortar will stay and a sandstone will disappear with time. So uh, really, we have to care about the, the quality and the compatibility of our uh, grout, either non-shrinkable or normal one or the one with expansion. We have a third question. What type of wood are the original ceiling beams? What is the uh, what is the type of added or replaced wood for the whole beam or end joint? Okay, usually in the Beiruti houses, wood is kotrani. Okay, so if we can have the same, let's say, quality of wood, it will be, let's say, uh, a, a good operation to do. Uh, however, however. Um, because of the damage, not all the suppliers are providing Kotrani. And with this economic crisis, uh, Kotrani is uh, not cheap. So uh, uh, we can replace it by another type uh, of wood. Uh, currently, many, uh, let's say, sites are using the what we call in Arabic the shuh, uh, the shuh uh, wood. So it is uh, cheaper. And uh, but we have to protect it from from humidity and from uh, water. So if we ensure these two conditions for uh, our newly installed wood, uh, we can use that. We always recommend uh, the the Kotrani because it contains a type of thing that will not uh, invite insects and biological. Uh, attacks uh, to harm uh, in the mass of this uh, of this wood uh, but we have to know also that uh, in terms of deformability uh, yesterday i i uh, sh showed you let's say a uh, a long term deflection let me check where it is for for uh, wood beams so uh, uh, wood will will have a long term deflection that will affect the horizontality of uh, of the floor system. Well, it is here. Okay, so uh, we are talking here about let's say uh, wood trees. Okay, uh, with uh, dimensions of uh, twenty five centimeters in width and let's say 30 centimeters in, in height. And with time, we got really a gap between, uh, or a, a deformation, a big deformation, because of the span of this, uh, of this uh, uh, room. And uh, structural engineers know that the deflection is proportional to the force of, uh, to the exponent four of the length. So with, with time, we will have this, uh, let's say, long-term deflection 
with wood elements that will really uh, affect uh, the tiling system. So with time, we have to add some support, like for example here, uh, it was uh, a steel uh, intervention in 1954 uh, by adding I-beams. But I really find this intervention very discreet, very, let's say, uh, uh, let's say it, it appears to me that it is a one unit for the steel beam and the, uh, uh, let's say, uh, wood, wood timber beam. Okay. Do you use stainless steel in every single element, even the shims? Uh, yes, we can use even uh, with the shims, we can use the stainless steel uh, plates. Uh, here, in fact, uh, for the shims, we can use normal, uh, normal, uh, let's say, uh, steel and uh, to paint it in order to have the same color of the uh, joints or, or, or of the uh, additional steel structure. But uh, generally speaking, when we have, let's say, uh, hidden parts or when we have a contact with the uh, lime or contact with the stone element, we do recommend the, uh, among the metal uh, steel, the stainless steel. However, I repeat again that we can use innovative uh, materials, more flexible. Uh, I showed them yesterday. And uh, for me, it's uh, it's better to have flexible reinforcement element uh, than to have rigid ones. But uh, stainless steel is very good. So uh, I do not recommend the use of stainless steel for mesh system, for the net system. Uh, so because uh, if, if one day there will be a problem, there will be a, a comment over the surface, the wall surfaces. Uh, however, for let's say connections and tie beams, uh, which can be easily removed or replaced, the same steel uh, 316L, not 304. Huh? Uh, we have to to uh, to be aware of, of this. So the 316L uh, is a very good material to be used uh, for restoration, structural restoration. Thank you, Michel. What type of binder is used in stitching? What kind of binder? Uh, yes, we can use, uh, yes, yes, we, we can use, uh, for example, a resin epoxy binder. But I also repeat that we have to look at the data sheet. Uh, in one of our uh, uh, recent projects, uh, the contractor uh, presented us many uh, resin, uh, sorry, many. Uh, uh, type of epoxy compatible with a, a sandstone material. So uh, this is really a, a key point when selecting our binder, uh, uh, let's say, uh, material. Uh, it, will, it, will, it will work. Any, any binder will work. But I'm talking about the sustainability. And uh, when we talk about the sustainability, it means uh, the, the long-term interaction between uh, the different uh, elements, including binders, including the interaction between the binder and stone, between stainless steel and, so, and stone, between normal steel and, and uh, lime mortar. So uh, really we have to be uh, very selective and uh, to take care of this point uh, uh, in, in, in a very detailed way uh, in order to have a, a long term, uh, uh, let's say, uh, a very good intervention. Uh, in restoration and in every uh, rehabilitation work, for us, the sustainability, the sustainability is a crucial point, uh, especially in restoration, because we are willing to preserve our built heritage. And when we are talking about uh, to, to conserve and, and uh, to, to maintain or to protect our, our heritage, it doesn't mean for one year or for 10 years or for 50 years. Uh, we are talking about uh, decades and maybe more. So uh, the selection of materials uh, is really uh, very important. And also, I will not uh, repeat what we have been uh, uh, taught in, in uh, restoration courses. So the reversibility and the integrity. So uh, for the structural interventions, in personal level, I always think how if one day uh, 
there is a, a better material, there is a better technique how to dismantle the the one that uh, we are doing uh, in, in our, let's say, uh, now, and, and to, to replace it in 50 years without harming to our structural system or to our built heritage. For example, uh, the, the, the photo uh, that we are seeing now, uh, dating from 1954, okay, we are talking about, let's say, more than uh, 60, year of, uh, 60 years of intervention. Until date, it is acceptable and it is still working. So uh, this way, uh, we have to think when doing our structural restoration. Uh, think that uh, this should be sustainable. Uh, think that uh, one day, if we have a better technique, how to dismantle or to remove or to replace without uh, a major damage for, for our structural system, and uh, this way we will preser preserve to the maximum uh, our uh, built heritage, especially the one we are talking about, uh, the, the Beirut built heritage. Thanks, Michel. We still have a few questions. So, um, for the threaded rods coming through the ring beams, couldn't we use the NHL5 instead of epoxy binder? Yes, we can. However, it all depends on the tensile, uh, let's say, force acting uh, on these threaded rods. Because uh, the threaded rods is, uh, system is uh, a very uh, stiff and very resistant system, the problem is not in the thread, threaded rods uh, itself. Uh, it's uh, in the, in the uh, connection between the threaded rod and, uh, let's say, other materials. So if the binding material is not very uh, strong to transmit this uh, internal force uh, existing in the threaded rod to other material like, for example, a wall or a confining belt or whatever. So uh, we should use, uh, uh, we should not use this NHL uh, 5. So it all depends on the calculation uh, we do. So uh, based on that, we, we, we can define uh, the internal forces uh, occurring uh, inside the, the threaded rods, and if uh, the NHL5 can uh, uh, transmit this effort to, to uh, other materials or, or not. So it is a bit scientifically, uh, uh, it's a scientific approach and based on scientific and, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, mathematical formulas to to uh, to define uh, if uh, the NHL five can resist or, or not to this kind of, of efforts. Thank you. Do you, uh, do you do any numerical modeling on these buildings? If you do, is it linear or non-linear? Which software tool do you prefer? Well, uh, it's a very a very very good question. Thank you for asking. So uh, let me let me uh, explain. Uh, during these two presentations, uh, I didn't talk about any, let's say, advanced tool for uh, for doing or for for the assessment of a historic building. However, however, these guidelines uh, I keep repeating should be uh, assisted or let's say not assisted should be based on a very detailed assessment based on, for first, a visual inspection. Second, tests, destructive, mind destructive and non-destructive tests. Third, calculation. We are talking about manual calculation. We are talking about, uh, for, for civil engineers, uh, uh, I'm addressing my, my uh, let's say, uh, my speech now to, to civil based on kinematic approach, so uh, based on uh, numerical modeling. And when it comes to numerical modeling, uh, let's say we have multiple approaches, linear, static, uh, model analysis, time history analysis, pushover analysis. So when we are talking about pushover, time history, we are talking about nonlinear uh, behavior of materials. So, and uh, for this purpose, we should know uh, 
very well the macro uh, excuse me if uh, I'm, I'm talking about something very advanced and uh, if uh, someone is not uh, understanding but i'm addressing my uh, this to, to to civil engineers now or to structural engineers who knows about the numerical modeling and the uh, non-linearity of materials so uh, back to the uh, numerical modeling uh, some of the numerical uh, modeling approach doesn't need a nonlinear, uh, let's say, numerical modeling, like for example, model analysis to know uh, the mode shapes of our of our building. However, for other types of uh, of approaches like time history or or pushover or uh, other approaches, we need to have a nonlinear uh, uh, behavior of our materials in compression, in tension, in shear. And here we are uh, going through uh, now the world of research. Uh, till date, uh, many research, uh, researchers uh, are uh, researchers are, are uh, exploring this field. How to 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 uh, know more about the macro behavior, not the micro behavior of our masonry. So uh, uh, this is an, not a very simple uh, field, but. Uh, Yes, we go through numerical modeling, advanced numerical modeling to detect the areas of uh, failure, of damage uh, when subjected to lateral loads like earthquake and, and uh, blast. Uh, the, the main uh, method used for this is the finite element method. And there is a lot of software, uh, but I will not uh, talk about any of them because we will not do a marketing for this uh, for this uh, issue. If someone needs to know more, uh, he can contact BHI or uh, me through BHI, and we can discuss it uh, in a very detailed way. Uh, we made a lot of this, and we have many applications that we can show you. And if one day we you need to to have other presentation about this issue. I'll be pleased to present uh, something uh, uh, advanced. Thank you. There is a follow-up question. How do you consider the damage of the of structural elements in your numerical modeling? How can we consider the damage of our structural element in numerical modeling? Yes. By considering by considering a non-linear behavior of the homogenized, uh, uh, let's say, uh, macro model. So uh, I will I will say it in a simple way. So we have the, the behavior of our stone block. We have the behavior of our mortar. Each one is different from the other. But when put together, we have what we say or what we call a homogenized behavior. So it is the behavior of the combination of uh, stone blocks and mortars. And it also depends if the wall is a single leaf wall or a double leaf wall. So uh, this is a, a, a trendy subject for how to homogenize the uh, behavior of our uh, masonry wall or unreinforced masonry wall. Once we do it, so we can plug in in a software, finite element or discrete element software, this behavior, the macro behavior in compression and tension and shear. And uh, the nonlinear behavior, I mean by that, the failure, the, the post-pick behavior, the uh, tension behavior, the tensile strengths, the compressive strengths. So all of that should be uh, injected in the numerical software, the finite element or the discrete element software or other type of software. And once we do our calculation, we will get as a result, for example, where we have, uh, an, an, uh, let's say, uh, non-linear deformation or res residual deformation or cracks or damages. So it all depends about what kind of constitutive model we have considered for our homogenized macro model of our unreinforced masonry. So it is really a very advanced topic and uh, we are working a lot on this topic uh, because uh, we cannot we cannot know uh, where we have our damage unless we have a representative behavior of our uh, mechanical behavior of our wall based on the single behavior, the separate behavior of the stone block from a part and the, our mortar joints 
from the other parts. Okay, uh, there is also uh, another approach to 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 calculate our mechanical uh, properties for, for for walls. It's the empirical approach. Uh, for example, the masonry uh, classification index. Uh, this is empirical. Uh, so we have the uh, numerical tools. We have the empirical tools. Uh, we have directly, for example, the flat jack uh, test that we can do on site to know, for example, the young models of our masonry uh, wall. Uh, we have other issues like, for example, sonic test or ultrasonic test. A uh, lot of, of uh, we have, for example, the sclerometer to know about the compressive strengths of our uh, uh, stone blocks or the mechanic properties of our mortar joint. Uh, we have the, the dynamic testing. Uh, we have, uh, for example, to, to take off some uh, coding uh, specimens and to go through a crushing uh, uh, test in the laboratory. So uh, uh, there is a lot of, of uh, testing campaign, let's say, uh, preceding uh, the calculation phase. Uh, and this is very important to do and uh, in order to, to have an idea about what is the behavior of our wall. Uh, if it is a double leaf, it, it, it differs from a single leaf uh, wall. If it is made of, of for example, basalt or, or, or sandstone, really it is different. If it is a dry uh, a joint, which means the, the, the stones are put uh, one above the other without uh, mortar or a uh, mortar joint really it uh, affects uh, the the final behavior of our uh, unreinforced masonry. Thank you. Do you do any experimental tests to validate your model, like experimental natural frequency testing? Yes, for sure. So, in fact, I, I talked about, for example, the testing of a flat jack, the, the dynamic testing, uh, which is the model. Uh, let's say. Uh, testing to calibrate our numerical model and to be sure that our boundary conditions or for example our uh, young modulus is uh, really correct so uh, once we do the numerical model and uh, we can do also the testing in parallel uh, based on the result of testing we can calibrate our model in order to have a similar uh, response of our structure between numerical and, uh, uh, let's say, testing. This way, we'll be sure that the, uh, uh, the other uh, uh, types of, of uh, calculation that we have to do, for example, pushover or, or time, uh, time, uh, time history analysis or uh, other types, they are really representative. They are really representing the, the real behavior of our structure. And this is very important because this way we can uh, assess and this way we can add, let's say, our reinforcement system. And after that, we can assess again what is the capacity of our building uh, after doing this type of, of testing before, after the numerical modeling before and after. So it's really a uh, let's say, a big topic and uh, a, a very, a based on uh, really advanced technique, uh, either uh, in terms of, uh, let's say, numeric, mod numeric modeling or uh, testing. But thank you for these questions. I didn't expect this kind of question, especially that uh, this, uh, this, uh, these presentations are there to professionals and non-professionals, but I can see that there is a high level uh, when asking these, uh, these type of questions. Thank you so much, Michel. Thank you for this great presentation. Thank you so much for you again. So uh, hope to see you again and uh, for, for the attendance. Uh, I think that you will publish uh, this on, on YouTube. And also uh, the manual for restoration will appear uh, let's say, hopefully, in a few time. So all these uh, information uh, can be checked again uh, on YouTube and through the manual of restoration. Thank you and see you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for joining us.
Our next presentation will be on the timber roofs if you wish to join. Thank you and see you soon. Thanks, Michelle.